Welcome to this video, and I'm Stephen Borse, and I'm going to talk about the new Amazon Time Stream. This is kind of a database, but actually it's kind of more of a data ledger system, and I'll compare and contrast it to DynamoDB, but the good thing about this database, as I'm going to talk about in these next few slides, it's extremely good for IoT data. Data that we don't need to persist, we don't need a high level of security for, and we just want to do some quick and easy analysis for. So I'll talk about that in a second, but basically if you look at this diagram, we can look at the left side as our IoT data coming in with a direct rule and action to Amazon Timestream. And then once it's held in that data ledger of Timestream, we can analyze it with like a visualization tool. I'm going to show you how to do that real easily in Grafana. But you can also use SageMaker to do models in PyTorch or Python or Spark or different kind of analytical packages. So I look at TimeStream as a quick and easy database, especially well suited for IoT. So what may be the difference between TimeStream and Dynamo? Well, first of all, in my experience playing with this for a couple of weeks is TimeStream's a lot cheaper. That's the good news. TimeStream is also much easier to set up. We can set it up directly from AWS IoT Core without too many problems. It also has built-in Athena-like SQL query. So if you've taken my course before, sometimes we're sitting with a data lake in S3 or data in DynamoDB, and then we have to go through a procedure of analyzing that data and getting some kind of schema with AWS Glue and then running queries on it with Athena or even Redshift. We don't need to do that with TimeStream. We can get Athena-like queries directly from TimeStream, so that's really nice. And TimeStream is really not appropriate for handling heterogeneous data either, nor is it really well integrated as much as Dynamo is, their number one database, with a lot of these different AWS services. So there is some official AWS videos that came out a couple weeks ago. In fact, this may be the video I'm making right now, it may be the only video that's not an AWS video on TimeStream. So I'll link the three that are kind of relevant to this video, but I think this video has a space where AWS doesn't really cover some of the direct integration I want to make with AWS IoT Core here in a second. My video, I would say, is a little bit easier than what they're kind of go over in the AWS videos. Those are kind of made more for their professional customers. This one's easy to get you started with TimeStream integrated with AWS IoT Core. Also a big benefit of the videos I'm going to make here, I'm going to make this first video with AWS IoT Core putting data into TimeStream, and the next video I'll go over integrating with Grafana. But unlike the AWS videos, we don't have to set up the Grafana CLI which is a locally installed command line interface. We're not going to use the AWS IoT SDK in JavaScript or Python to run a local producer using Python 3 and Bado. Now these producers is simply just a program that produces random IoT data packages. We're going to do that directly from AWS IoT. So we're not going to have to run a local producer using Python 3. You can also, and I've seen this done before, you can run a producer program in Lambda and you can also run in Cloud9. Another big benefit of my video is with Grafana in the next video, you're not going to have to make a credential file in a specific format and you can find that and I'll link it in the AWS Developer Guide for TimeStream. I'm simply going to plug in my SIGV4 credentials directly into Grafana with a user that's just constructed for TimeStream. And one thing to remember, people get confused about this SIGV4 credentials. SIGV4 is simply Amazon specific user ID and secret key. So when you make a user, whether it's a limited privilege user or super user, you're given two keys. One is your user ID and one is your secret key. Finally, when we're in Grafana in the next video, I'm just simply going to use the cloud-based install. So no Grafana files to install locally on the computer, which I think is a big help. And with the little data package that I'm going to produce, we're simply going to do a graph without having to side low a pre-made graph showing like 30 different variables. So it's going to be super easy. So let's move on now that I've done this introduction and talk about sending data from AWS IoT Core to our Grafana table. And I'll show you how to design and construct that all moving forward from this video. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to complete the AWS IoT to TimeStream integration. And in the next video, we'll do some visualizations. 
So you need to be in a region that supports time stream. I'm in U.S. West 2, Oregon, that's the region closest to me, but U.S. East 1, North Virginia, generally for my students on my Udemy course, I generally consider that the easiest region to get in because they get these new AWS services first. So make sure you have Amazon Timestream available. But I don't need to go to Amazon Timestream. I can actually construct my Timestream table directly from IoT Core. So go ahead and click IoT Core and I'm simply going to create a new rule. So I'm going to go over here to Actions, Rules, and go ahead and create a new rule. And I'm going to name my rule Timestream DB8. How about that? Pretty catchy name as always. And I want to construct this in a certain way because when you fill the database with time stream data, it doesn't really work being columnar format the same way Dynabo or actually a lot of the RDS databases work. So I'm going to do something a little bit different because there's some what I consider some oddities to this. So rather than normally what I do and take the whole incoming IoT package, I'm simply going to extract a couple variables I want out of there. So the two I'm going to extract are temperature you know, your typical IoT data payload test package and humidity. Great. And I'll keep that as my rule. Again, I'm not going to take that wildcard star as a whole data package. And I'll just keep my topic as IoT slash topic. That's fine for now. Okay, let's go ahead and add time stream now. So go ahead and add this action. And the very last one, these tend to be in date of release is let's write our message, which is our incoming data payload, to a time stream table. Go ahead and click that and configure action. Now, unlike in the past, you used to have to go to a different service to construct your database or your additional service needs to integrate the AWS IoT Core. They've changed that. Now you can construct it directly from AWS IoT Core. So that's what we want to do. Let's create a new time stream database. So I'm going to say create new database. So you have two options here. You can either take a sample database and there's two pre-made sample databases that are already filled with information that you can use in data. And if you go to, again to those AWS official videos, they'll show you how to do that. We're gonna create our own database for this. So I'm gonna say standard database and we can call this anything we want. Let's call this time stream DB. I'll just say eight as an extension. I'm gonna keep the default encryption extension on here like this and go ahead and create this database. It's gonna take a second here, create our database. And you don't see it on here, and the reason is, is I'm on page two. So I'm gonna to go to TimeStream DB. That's the one I just created here. And I'm gonna to need to create a table within my database that I just created. So it really doesn't matter what I call my table, as long as I remember what it is when I wanna integrate it to AWS IoT Core. So I'll say my TimeStream table. Eight, doesn't really matter. It's a good idea to pick a memory retention period. I'll pick, say, two days, two days, and then it'll move over to magnetic storage if I'm not using it after two days, and I'll have three days of magnetic storage. I'm not going to use any tags, so go ahead and create that table, and that table will be held within our database. All right, great. So we have our database, and we have our table within our database. So now we can come back here to the previous tab that does it automatically right back to AWS IoT Core and now I'll refresh this and now that database that I just created and hopefully you just created with that table will now be populated and here it is right here and then we only have one table in that database and that's it right there so that's all we have to do that's about the easiest database creation you're ever going to do in AWS okay so now we do have to do dimensions and we're going to add our timestamp so you remember an IoT topic I selected out of there humidity and temperature. So what's odd about TimeStream DB, it's still actually gonna send the whole package through even though I only want it to filter for those two variables. So given that, let's add a third variable that I'm gonna hard code as a literal. So a typical one we'd like to use, and we'll name it device ID. We're gonna name it here's device ID, but when I send the package in, I'm gonna call it device ID literal here. So it has to be spelled like this when we construct our IoT payload. So again, it's gonna be called device ID. We can call this whatever we want here when we construct our time stream table with incoming data, but the literal name in our IoT core JSON package needs to match this exactly as a literal. And I don't want a dash, I want to underscore. I'm just being picky about that. 
All right, this you can't change. So I want, it's a time-based, time series database, you know, just like InfluxDB or Timescale. So we always want that time dimension. So here it is. This is going to be an automatic function that's going to timestamp our incoming JSON IoT payload when it comes into AWS IoT Core. Then the final thing we want to do is go ahead and create a role that'll give us access to Timestream DB. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a default role. And I'm just going to say Timestream role 8. And if we actually go to IAM and look what this role is, it's simply going to be a put into Timestream DB. So let's go ahead and add that action. And we're almost done here. Okay, so we have the selection here we want. We have our time stream table here. We don't need to edit that. I'm not going to add an error action. I'm not going to add any tags. So go ahead and create that rule. And then finally, if you have any old rules enabled, like I do up here, I'm going to say disable this. And I want to make sure my time stream rule I just created is enabled. Awesome. So we're good to go. So all we need to do now is start sending data package through AWS IoT Core to fill our time stream data table. And again, the big difference in this video between the AWS official videos is I'm not going to use a locally installed or a Cloud9 or Lambda based producer program. I'm just going to send like five or six simple data packages directly from IoT Core. So let's do that now. Go ahead to the test. And we're going to publish to that topic that's specified in the previous rule. So remember that was IoT topic forward slash topic. That's what we need to put as our topic to make sure it gets intercepted by that rule. So let's go ahead and send in our data. Do you remember what those three variables were? Temperature, humidity, and device ID. So I'm just going to say the first one temperature. And let's make up a fake temperature. Make sure I put it in JSON format. I'll say 66. It's fairly cold. That'll be in US Fahrenheit. Second one, humidity, our key value pair. And let's go humidity, 77. And then finally, let's do the device ID. Now remember, the device ID, well, actually all three of them have to be spelled exactly right to be intercepted by our rule in AWS IoT Core. So to spell it exactly right, it's the underscore one, the literal device underscore ID. And this will also be a string for this dimension. So I'll just say sensor, this will be sensor one. How about that? All right, that format should be correct. Everything looks to be spelled correct. Double check that you spelled everything correct. Let's go ahead and publish that. Now let's change it. So we get a linear graph that's climbing. I'm gonna call this sensor two. And again, your graphs will look different depending what values you put in here. You don't need to use my values. I'm just changing them all here to make sure that actually things are going to get recorded right and look cool. So, you know, our graphs are bouncing all over. I'll put 107. We'll go up by 20 on that for sensor 4. And I'll just make one more sensor data. I'll say we hit 100 and 117 so that's actually I think the most humidity you can actually have is 100 so that's not realistic but who cares and then finally sensor 5 publish data awesome now the last thing we need to do is go see what's going on that we filled our time stream table if we didn't fill our time stream table we're going to be in trouble and then I'll run an SQL query on it as well so I'm going to go here to my time stream table I'm simply going back to the previous tab and I'm going to run a query on it. So I'm going to go to Query Editor. Now there's some pre-built queries in here, which makes things really nice. Again, this is your Athena-like query service. So I'm going to go here to the database I just created. That's this one. And then I have one table in this database, so I can hit this table. And if you do that, you're going to notice when I go to Preview Data, it automatically changed to my current database and data table. And this is just a little preview. It's going to print up to 100 rolls. So let's just go make sure when we run this that we get those five entries. So go ahead and hit Run. And if we've done everything right, we're going to have our five entries. Awesome. And let's make sure they're right. It does it from latest to earliest. So it has two for each. And again, this is kind of the way a time scale database works is it puts a different dimension for every variable measure name. So that's why we have two for sensor one and two for each sensor. 
is it's separated by temperature and humidity. And then we get the free timestamp on it too. That's our incoming IoT timestamp from that macro function. It creates it automatically when it's sent up to the cloud. So this looks great. We have everything we need to start validly recording and manipulating our data. So good job. So we're ready to move on to that second video now where we'll tie this data table into Grafana and tie it into QuickSight so we can actually do some cool visualizations. So hopefully you've done everything successful. If not, post your question in the comments or in the forums or wherever you'd like, and I'll try to answer them. And you can just review the video to make sure you've done everything correctly. But it looks good from here, and let's move on to the second video.